if you haven't had a chance really to, to read your press release, um, we are talking about a true story of a, a real hero who uh, spent his life as a soldier, a brave one, um, and one who um, saved many lives, and then later in life uh, became head of security at Morgan Stanley in the Twin Towers. And uh, because he had trained his charges so well, a uh, military man that he was, he got all 2,700 of them out safely, literally singing them down the stairs uh, through his bullhorn with his Cornish folk songs and saved their lives and then went, in to, uh, went back to check on things and perished. It's uh, an amazing story and we're going to hear about how it all uh, came together. James, let's start with you. Um, what, you are a Wall Street writer primarily, written about the financial world. How did you come across this subject as something you wanted to tackle? Well, it actually sort of started out as a Wall Street story. Um, the day after the World Trade Center collapsed, I was sitting in my apartment, numb, like I think everyone else in New York, and David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, called me and said, well, you're our Wall Street person. Go down there. So I did, and I, I was really grateful because it gave me something to do. But um, all the focus was on who had died that day, and much of it was on Cantor Fitzgerald, the firm at the top of the, uh, the building who lost everyone who was there. And I contributed some material for that issue of The New Yorker, but I believe I was down there that day, and a lot of you are journalists, and you'll, you'll recognize the experience. Somebody mentioned to me the sort of mystery, which was Morgan Stanley was the largest employer in the building with over 3,000 personnel there, and they lost almost no one. People above them were wiped out, people below them were wiped out, and it just stuck in my head, isn't that odd? And then I brought that up maybe three or four weeks later at a dinner, and someone was sitting next to me connected to Wall Street, and he said, oh, you know, there's some guy at Morgan Stanley who like got them all out. And he then proceeded to tell me things that were completely factually incorrect, but <laughs> nevertheless, I had, the, I had the mystery, and then I had the beginning of a solution. And I thought, gosh, isn't that interesting? Um, so it was, it was kind of the opposite of the story. Every, everybody was writing about who died, and, and suddenly it occurred to me, I really should maybe write about who survived. And so I called Morgan Stanley, the PR person, and said I wanted to know more about this head of security that I'd heard about. And they acted like they didn't know who he was. And they wouldn't say anything, they wouldn't cooperate, and um, I, I was about to hang up, thinking, well, I guess this is at a dead end, when the PR woman, I hope I'm not getting her in trouble when I say this, said, if I were you, I would call Susan Rescorla, and here's her unlisted telephone number in New Jersey. <laughs> so I called Susan, and I went out to meet her in New Jersey. I took my notes. We sat down. I, I think I wrote two words down, like the date and the time in the notebook. And then the tears started flowing, and Susan got out the box of, hand, of uh, Kleenex. And two hours later, I was on the train back to New York, and I looked at my notebook. There, I hadn't written down another word. It was just an incredible experience. And it really, from then on, all I can say is, this is different from my other works. Um, it just it took over my life. It was I couldn't not tell this story. Uh, nobody wants to have to deal with a tragedy like this, and I hope I never write another story like this again. But given that it happened, and the elements of the story, which I think are what appealed to the people in the opera about it, the amazing characters, the huge themes, love, death, honor, duty, it was all there in front of me, and I thought, I cannot stop until, until this is on the page. And uh, I've written, I'll have written nine books when my next book comes out, and a lot of people say, oh, what's your favorite book? And it's like asking a parent, what's your, who's your favorite child? And I never want to answer that, but this book is, is in a, category completely to its own in my work, and uh, it's really thanks to Susan and the characters who experienced this and then were willing to share in intimate detail exactly what happened and how they felt about it. Jim, did you ever imagine that uh, this would become an opera? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer to that is no. Susan, you've had the experience of having your life story told uh, along with that of your late husband and his good friend uh, Dan Hill. Um, what was your reaction when you heard it was going to become an opera? Um, it, it's, let me just start out. The day after 9-11, I was riveted into the media. And I said to myself afterwards, how in the world could anybody have known about Rick at that moment in time? How would they have known? The BBC was calling you know, from, from London, and um, it just went on and on. And to tell you the truth, it really never stopped. 
And it was so encompassing that I don't even know how I got through the first couple of years because you're so in shock that you can speak anywhere and do anything and so forth. But in December of 2001, I received a call from, from Jim and uh, he said, um, I would like to write your love story in the New Yorker magazine. And he came out just like he said, and we cried, and he did this incredible article. Um, and then from there, every time he came out, I kept saying, I, want, I, want, I have to write this book about Rick. Do you think you could write it for me? And, and, and I'll do the epilogue. And, and he said, I'm busy and blah, blah. And so anyway, finally, I begged him so much, he said. <laughs> He said that he had to write it, and indeed he did. And, um, and actually when the book, you know, I had read a lot of the, uh, obviously I had been reading all the time what was going to, the content of the book and so forth and so on. But when the book actually arrived at my house, I took the book and I got it in my car and I couldn't even open it. And then finally over the years, you know, I, I've read pieces of it and then finally the entire story. So. Several years ago, about four or five years ago, uh, this, uh, I was approached by Chris and by Donna. They came to my house, uh, and, um, and Dan Hill was there at the time also to talk to us. Were you there? No. And um, anyway, to talk about an opera. And to me, it was like, I can't even, I can't even understand how, who would want to come to this? Who would want to read this? Who, you know, I, I couldn't even fathom it. And so now the months have gone by and it became more real and more real and suddenly I was coming out to San Francisco and I was not prepared for what happened when I walked in this room yesterday. I just couldn't believe, first of all, that Mel Melody, okay, and I were, we're twins I think because she, she was so emotional in singing her, 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 her beautiful soprano voice and all the others who were singing and the words and everything that they had done and everything I would have wanted and dreamed of, the emotion and the passion that I felt and feel, is that's what I wanted an audience to see. But this wasn't any make-believe story. This was a tragedy in our country, a tragedy in the United States of America. And my husband was one of many, many heroes on that day. But to me, he was my hero before this even happened. So I am so honored to be here and to have this going on. I can't tell you, I'm still pinching myself. It's like not real. But anyway, um, I thank you all and I just thank Jim for do, writing the story and that's it, I'm honored, thank you. Well, we're very honored to have you here and being part of this process. It's, uh, it's great to have your involvement. Susan, thanks so much.